All right, so this is now lecture <clears throat> number 68 of our Mor Nebuchadnezzar podcast. Uh, let me get this cap camera on me. We are going to start at the bottom of page 308. That's part two, chapter 19. And in this chapter, remember that the basic disagreement between Rambam and Aristotle that 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 is uh, we've been discussing the last couple chapters and we'll be discussing the next few chapters is this idea that according to Aristotle, uh, there never was a singular moment of creation, right? Um, but, you know, everything is the way it is because that's the way it has to be, right? Because those are the rules of nature. Those are the rules of physics. And those rules would dictate that, therefore, things always had to be this way. So if they always had to be this way, then the world must have always been. And the world also always will be because these are the these these are the laws of nature. If the laws of nature dictate that you know you plant a seed, you get a tree. The tree makes pl seeds, and the plant a seed, you get another tree. So then that has to go back all the way, right? Forever, right? There has can't be a point where that rule of nature ever changed. And 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 um. And that's that's Aristotle's idea. So the bottom line is, according to Aristotle, things are the way they are because they have to be. Now, the, the modern corollary to that idea, right, using modern science would be that all of science, right, is based on the specific rules of physics, right, that, that dictate how things are. And they are that way because that's the rule. That's the way it is, right? It has to be that way. Nothing is that way because any being ever chose to make it that way. And it's also not that way because of chance happened. It just happens to be. Rather, it is that way because that's built into the, the physical reality of the universe. Rambam took issue with that and said that 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 the Aristotle's the the proof that the world always has been is based on the physical principles of the universe, right? Which we see in front of us. However, those physical if one believes like we believe that there was a moment of creation, and that there was a being which we'll call God who made that creation happen right, then those rules that we see were also created at that moment of creation, right? So you know, we can't use those rules to dictate to us what must have been before, so to speak, right? Because, because those rules didn't apply before because they weren't created yet, right? So that was the, the fundamental difference between Rambam and Aristotle. And, and we talked about last time how the Rambam talked about this idea of particularization, right? Which means that, that that there are so many things in the world that we can't, we know that they're different. We know that the different things, in, whether it's on this world or in the spheres of the heavens, but in the universe, right, that this one is different than that one. But there's no real reason why this one should be different than that one. Unless you posit that God wanted to create, or some being, which we'll call God for now, wanted to create a world that would have certain properties and characteristics which is the world that we happen to live in today. And in order to bring that about, he had to make all these things be the way they are, because that's all part of the makeup of the universe. If things were different, then he wouldn't have had the effect that he wanted, right? So, um, so in other words, all the particularizations are explained and make sense once you posit that there's a creator. And then once you posit there's a creator, then you're also positing that there is some level of purpose. And that's that's really what it boils down to. If everything is the way it is because it has to be, then there, then there's no purpose to the universe, right? It, it just is because that's the way it has to be. Everything has to be the way it is, right? But if there is a creator, then there is a purpose to the universe. What that purpose is is not what Ramam is dealing with right now, but he's just establishing that there is. So now at the bottom of 308, with that little introduction, let's... um. Uh, let's uh, talk a little, let, let's continue uh, off from, from that point. Know that on the basis of our opinion, um, oh, by the way, I, I'm going to get a little bit ahead of myself and I want to make another statement, right? A lot of these things that the, the, when the Ramam gives examples of what he calls particularization, and he's going about to give examples of, of the spheres, why certain spheres move one direction, certain spheres move the other direction. Why in one sphere is there a million stars and the other spheres there's 10 stars? Why in one sphere the stars are over here and the other are over there? And what's the difference in the sphere between whatever the stuff is that makes up the sphere itself and the stuff that makes up the star and, and itself? And, and the Ramam is going to say, right, 
that that um, that that Aristotle has no reason, no way to explain why these differences exist, why these particularizations exist, why this is like this and why that is like that. But we don't have that problem because we can say the reason why is because God created a world this way. Now remember that that Rambam has already acknowledged that science advances and knowledge of science advances and some of these things may be explained, right? But it's also true that most people that read Rambam and, or any, any of the thinkers of, of those days understand that Rambam pretty much assumed that they had, for the most part, the understanding of how the universe works. They couldn't even have imagined, the Rambam couldn't have imagined what we know today in modern physics, right? It's, it's so, it's, we've so dramatically went past that. So these particular particularizations, and excuse the uh, double talk speak there, um, that the Rambam uses are no longer relevant today because we don't, there are no spheres, right? And the stars and the, the substance of the spheres are, are different because there is no such thing as substance in the spheres. It's just called space. And, and by using the, the powers and forces of nature that we're aware of today, we can, for the most part, explain why, you know, why the, the moon goes around this, this way or the sun goes around, because we know the forces of gravity, we know that things orbit other things. A lot of these things have been explained. However, that being said, till this day, there are many parts of science, right, things that we've identified in science that we don't yet know right what the reason is why they are that way and when i mentioned that that podcast physics to god they lay they do a much better job than i'm going to do explaining these things but the things that i'm referring to is you know throughout the 20th century the search of physicists was to find what they used to call the or still call the grand unified theory that is the one basically the mathematical equation the theory that will explain all of physics why everything is the way it is now as science progressed Instead, and, and I, I'm, I'm not an expert in this, I'm just talking from my reading. Uh, yes, listening to that podcast was highly influential, so I'm giving you the source. But I, I, you know, after reading you know, various books on modern theoretical physics, what we're finding out today is that, is that all is we're, we're getting, instead of closer and closer to a grand unified theory, we're getting farther and farther from it. We are consistently identifying con what we call constants, physical constants of nature. Right? These are physical constants, which are usually, they're, they're numbers, right? And the numbers are, are, are pinpoint exact, you know, like, um, um, and, they, and they're, you know, you know, you know 3.36612333, when you talk about the various forces that exist, and I can't remember the amount, I think there's like 26 or 27 different physical constants. And each one of those constants define and are necessary for the universe to be the way it is. Any single one of those constants, if it was even 0 0.00000000000001 different than what it is, the entire universe wouldn't exist in the way we see it today, right? And there's still, of course, the possibility that many of these constants, if not all, might eventually be unified in some way, shape, or form. But at this point in science, we're still at the same, the same philosophical place that Aristotle and Rambam were, right? What do I mean? Of course, we've advanced in our knowledge of science way far ahead. However, this idea that there's these physical things of nature that make the universe the way it is, that are responsible for the universe that we see, and they're different things, and we have no reason, no way to explain why they are the way they are, right? So if we assume for a moment that today, you know, we got it all, that this is the end, the end of science is we figured out all the physical constants and now we can explain everything, but we just have to accept that these 27, I might be off by the number, but somewhere around that physical constants, right? That's the blue, that's the blueprint for the universe because all of these numbers are exactly the way they are, right? So then we'd be left at this exact same spot that the Ramam is saying that Aristotle is left in. Why are these particularizations the way they are, right? Well, if one were to posit, right, you're left with three possibilities. Either they are the way they are because they have to be, which is basically what Aristotle is saying, right? Although I don't know, and Aristotle would have to admit, I don't know why they have to be that way, but maybe we'll keep studying and we'll figure it out, right? Or two, they are the way they are because they were created. When the universe was created by the creator, 
He said, I need a universe that has these 27 constants exactly like this, because the universe that I want is the universe in which you and I will be having a, a Marnabuchim class on a Wednesday night, right? He wants the universe that will produce these results, right? Or number three, that it's complete chance, right? In other words, the, you, there's eight, there's in the, the number the, the would be mind boggling, astronomical numbers that we can't even comprehend how big those numbers would be because each one of those constants are so specific and detailed. And you multiply each one by all the possibilities of the other one to get 27 combinations. You're talking about a, an incomprehensibly infinitesimal chance, right? That all those numbers would line up exactly the way they are to produce the universe the way they, the way it is, right? However, that's the universe that we happen to be in. And you might play out the idea, maybe there's 18 gajillion, I mean, a number that we can't even comprehend, uh, universes that happened with those constants a little bit different but they never resulted in anything, or maybe they exist somewhere else, right? Right? But they never resulted in any comprehensible universe because all they were was chaos and atoms and molecules bouncing all over the place. But this universe came to the thing that we see today, right? And we happen to be in that universe, right? So those are the three possibilities. And more and more people, and that would be what they call today in modern uh, scientists would call that the multiverse, right? The idea that there is bazillions of universes, right? And and every possibility in theory happened, right? But the only one that we're in, the one that we're watching and seeing is the one that happens to have all the constants that result in the universe that you and I can see and have our Mordechai class on Wednesday night in, right? So, um, so, so, and the Ramam is dealing with those same three possibilities. Aristotle saying that, no, there's a physical constant that has to be the way it is. The Ramam saying that, no, it is the way it is, right? It could have been a million different ways, but it is the way it is because God decided to make it that way because he wanted a world like this. And, and then the third one, that it's all chance, that it's all happenstance, that it just happens to be. So now, um, so now let's go, go I'm, I'm going to read it. I, I know I jumped ahead of myself, but what I just explained well, number one, help us bring this and make this relevant to 2023. And, and number two, uh, it will help us understand what we're about to read. So no, on the base of our opinion, that is, and our opinion, me and you, us Jews reading the, the, the Mornobuchim now, that is the opinion of the community of those who affirm the production of the world in time, that there was a moment of creation. All this becomes easy. In other words, all those particularizations that we talked about last week, right, is consistent with our principles. For we say that there is a being that has particularized just as it willed every sphere in regard to the motion of rapidity. We do not know in what respect there is wisdom in making these th things exist in this fashion. Like we don't fully comprehend why God had to make it this way and not that way, why the moon goes around this way and not that way, but there's a reason, right? Now, if Aristotle had been able, as he thought, to give us the cause for the differences between the motions of the spheres, right? So that these should be in accordance with the order of the position. In other words, he could have, if he could have explained it to us why, in that case, the cause of particularization would have been constituted by the differences between the motions of the spheres, just as the causes of the differences between the elements lies in their various positions and so on. However, think, I'm, I, now it's, 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 the bottom line of what he's saying in this paragraph, right, is if Aristotle could have explained to us what's going on in the heavens in the same way that he did such a great job explaining what's going on, Beneath the heavens, meaning of this world, remember in, in Aristotle's scheme, there's these spheres of heaven and underneath of which in the middle is the universe, is the planet that we live on, right? Which he wouldn't have called a planet, right? Which this is the middle of everything. So in this world, he had all explained, right? Because we see it, you know, and he had it all explained. But he couldn't, he couldn't explain those heavens. A fact that makes even more clear than what has been said about the existence of particularization in the sphere. And with regard to which no one would be able to find a cause particularizing it other than the purpose is the existence of the stars. So another thing, if you just look at the stars, then you'll really see that nobody could explain why they are there, why they are the way they are, right? And in fact, Abu Nasr al-Farabi, right, in his glosses on the acroasis, has made a statement of which his text is as follows. There is a difference between a sphere and the stars. Remember, the stars are embedded within the spheres. The sphere is transparent and the star is not transparent. And the cause for this lies in the fact that there's a difference between the two matters and the two forms. But it's a very small difference. This is what he says. This is literally the text of his statement. I, however, do not say small, 
but they're very different, right? But I don't infer this from the fact that one is transparent and one is not transparent, but from the motion, right? Accordingly, it has become clear to me that there are three kinds of matter and three kinds of form. The bodies that are always by themselves at rest, those are the stars, they're just sitting there. The bodies that are always in motion, which are the spheres that are going around, right? And, and the bodies that are sometimes moving and sometimes not, and those are the elements which make up the universe that we live in, the field, world that we live in. Would that I knew what made the two kinds of matter. Why is it that this matter does this and that matter does that? You don't know. You didn't explain it. Now, obviously, a lot of this, this specific question has been explained, right? First of all, there is no such thing as different types of matter in the spheres. There's no such thing as spheres, right? However, what, what, like I explained to you, but the, the philosophical background does make sense to us today. And if I were to replace this with a sentence from 2023, I would say, I can't explain to you, right, right? I can tell you that there's different constants that have different values for different that for different physical phenomenon in, in the universe, but I can't tell you why this one is this and why this one is this and why that one is that. You understand? That's why this this is how what Ramam is saying is still relevant today. To sum up, it would be a strange thing that there should be two different bodies, one of which being fixed in but not mixed with. Um, I'm going to run this through and, and be in, in the, the last line. And it's even stranger that there should exist the numerous stars that are in the eighth sphere, all of which are, are globes, some of them small, some of them big, one star over here, one star over there. What is the cause? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of skimming through. I'm on 310 now. What is the cause of this particular one stretch that should be 10 stars and another one that should be no stars, right? A blank spot where we don't see these stars. Again, the whole the body of the whole sphere is one simple body in which there are no differences, Right. That's the whole sphere. So what, according to Mugasso, in one sphere that should be more fitted to have a particular star and then the other part doesn't have a particular star. All this and everything of this sort is very unlikely or rather would come near to being impossible if it would have if it happened because it had to happen that way. Right. Uh, And of necessity. Right. As is the opinion of Aristotle. If, however, it is believed that all of this came about in virtue of the purpose of the one who purposely made it. thus, So now I'm going to translate into 2023 terms. To say that all of these constants are the way they are just because, right, because they have to be, right, but without explaining why is difficult to comprehend, right? Why do they have to be? Why can't they be 0.000001 different, right? But if I say that they are the way they are because when God created the world, right, he created those differences to be exactly the way they are, then it all makes sense. Then I can understand this complex idea. Now, someone can argue and say, well, hold on, let's keep working. Maybe we'll figure it out. And Ramam, as we've seen numerous times, would agree with that statement. Go ahead, right? Keep working. But at this point, it still makes more philosophical sense. At least that's what Ramam is arguing to, to realize that these things don't just didn't just happen to be that way. They are they were set that way by with someone, someone with the capital O had a purpose for it, right? And there would remain no other point. Um so Uh, Except if you were to say, what is the cause for this having been purposed? What is known may be epitomized as follows. All this has been produced for an object that we do not know and is not an aimless and fortuitous act. In fact, you know that the veins and nerves of any individual dog or ass have not happened fortuitously, nor are there measures fortuitous. It is by chance that one vein is thick or one is thin. One nerve has many uh, branches and the other has less. One goes straight, the other one is curved, right? Uh, but, but, But rather... We, we know that it's not random. It's done because it has a purpose. It has a reason. So the same thing when we look at the spheres in the world around us, right? Hold on. With one, I just want to finish this thing and we'll get to the question. All this is, um, is as it is with a view to the useful effects whose necessity is known. How then can one who uses his intellect imagine that the positions, measures, and numbers of the stars and the motions of the various spheres are without an object or fortuitous, that they just happen to be the way they are. They have no purpose or reason to be that way. They just happen to be that way. There is no doubt that all these things are necessary according to the purpose of the one who purposes. On the other hand, the supposition that all these things have been ordered because they have to be in virtue of necessity and not in virtue of a purpose is very remote indeed from being conceivable. So the Ramam is basically making the argument from complexity, which we talked about last week a lot, right? right? Which is, which is one can say that everything is the way it is and everything, ha- all of these things, because they have to be, because there's some th- scientific rule that makes it have to be that way. Or you can say it is that way because 
because when God created the world, he made those things, he put those things into play so that we can have the world that we all live in and experience today. To my mind, there is no proof of purpose stronger than the one founded on the differences to I'm thinking, and I think that there's no nothing greater than the what you see in the stars, the difference between the different stars and the different spheres. Remember, in the Ramam's mind, all the questions about what happens on this world we've answered. The questions about what's going on in the spheres, that we have no idea. And the Ramam's saying, since I have no idea and Aristotle couldn't come up with it. Nobody since then could come up with it. Even with the more advanced mathematics that the Rambam told us that we have today, in other words, in Rambam's day, that we did that Aristotle didn't have, we still can't figure this all out. So it must be that the, the reason why it was done that way is in order is because God purposed it that way. Um, and thus, in the traditional story of Avraham Avinu, everyone knows that he contemplated the stars, and that's how he came to God. Um, again, Yeshayahu says. You know, lift your up on eyes and see. Who look up to the sky and see who created these? Some people sometimes you look at that and you see and you think about the awe that's inspired by looking into the sky. But the Ramam is specifically saying we look at the stars and say, why in the world is it all this way? It doesn't make we don't have no scientific principles to explain all of this. So it must be that God designed it that way, and so on. Um, this is the correct proof, which is not exposed to doubt. Okay. Even though he said several times, he's made several statements that it's not it, it's um it's not it's not a demonstration. In other words, it's not an a hundred percent proof, right? But it it makes your mind think that this is much more likely to be the explanation. And that's that's where he's he's aiming at. You look at the stars and you think this world how something that could result in something so spectacular and so complex and so incredible, right? Right? Could it be that it all just happens to be that way because it has to be? Or is it that way because there's a reason for it to be that way? And once you say there's a reason, you've already admitted that there's a creator, right? So um, the explanation thereof is as follows. With regard to all the differences in the things beneath the sphere, right? You can make out that they are particularized to the powers of the sphere, just as Aristotle. Now, everything we see in this world works with through all the laws of science that Aristotle explained to us. All the rules that you read in the science books, that's how it works, right? But who is the one who particularized the differences that are found in the spheres and the stars? Who's the one that made the spheres go round and round, which makes everything happen on this world? Remember, that's how they viewed the world in those, those days, the physics, right? In other words, it would be the same thing as you or I asking the questions. Everything that happens in my body happens because, you know, my heart beats and, 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 and it, the blood circulates because we've explained how the lungs work, the hearts work. We explained how the, biochem the biochemistry of everything that happens in the blood, and 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 we explained uh, so many things. We've explained. We explained how molecules and atoms work, and how cells work, and how, so much stuff we explained. Right, right. Those are the rules. But who set into motion the constants, the physical constants of nature, which were necessary for a world like the one we live in to evolve to the place that it got? Right. If not God, may be exalted. I'm in the middle of the big pat chapter. 311, like about the 15th line. Unless it be God, may he be exalted. If, however, someone says that the separate intellects did it, but let's say you say, you know what, maybe it wasn't God. Maybe it was, I told you that there's intellects, there's angels that make the spheres go around, right? So um, so that th doesn't help, right? He doesn't gain anything. He gains nothing. The explanation of this is as follows. The intellects are not bodies, which they would have to be in order to have a local position. So why then should one particular, it still doesn't explain. The intellects are just intellect. So why in the world did they decide, one sphere decided to spin to the right, the next one decided to spin to the left. One sphere decided to have 100 billion stars, the other one decided to have 2 billion stars. The one, you know, one of them decided to go to the east, to the north, and so on. One of them decides to go real fast, and the other one decides to go real slow, right? So, so what, what did you gain? Why did those intellects make these decisions? Again, there must be, of thus of necessity, one cannot avoid saying the nature and substance of that particular sphere require, right? It has to go that way, all right? And what what you know, um, what principle makes it that it has to go that way? Well, that's the way God set it up, right? So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna open the floor in a minute. You'll see if I'm I promise. I just the the last paragraph of this chapter I'm, I want to read. We have accordingly come back to the point we are dealing with first. Accordingly, we shall say if the matter of all the spheres is one and the same in virtue of what thing, if everything is based on the same matter, right? And we now today know pretty much that mo everything in the universe boils down to a certain number of subatomic particles, right? 
we once had it down to the to the atom now then we had it down to the neutron and the electron and the proton and now we have it down to the the substances that make up the neutron and the proton you know the quarks and the higgs boson and uh, whatever i don't you know some people here might know better than me but but we but we still end up with those subatomic particles right that make everything up so how then is there to be found in that sphere a certain desire different from the desire of the other sphere and so on and so forth there must something that there must be some being that particularizes in other words there must be some i'll say it god who decide who wanted to have a the particular world the world which is made up of a, of a saul weinreb and a and a, and a john doe and a and you know and uh, and uh, mary jane and and he wanted a world that would result in all of those particular things and a cat and a dog and a monkey and a, and a bear right the, all of those particularizations was what he wanted the end result to be so therefore he put into the world and the nature these constants of nature that allowed this universe to to come about so then um in the end, uh, this examination, and I just turned to 312, and then I'm going to end this chapter, and we'll, I'll, I'll take, uh, I'll open the floor. This examination has thus conducted us to the investigation of two problems, one of which may be stated as follows, right? Is it of necessity, obligatory or not, considering the existence of these differences, that these should be due to the purpose of one who purposed and not due to necessity? In other words, it, can I prove to you that what I just told you is true, right? Is it, does it have to be? right that that the because we see a world with such complex differences complex particularization is it necessary to say that a god created it all or is it possible that it is that way because it has to be that's problem number one okay um and i'm going to tell you that i'm going to give it away the ramam is going to end up saying it's not necessary but it makes much 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 more sense to say that okay but we're going to get there and he's kind of said that already but we're going to say it more and more the second problem may be stated as follows supposing that all this is due to the per let's assume for a moment that it is due to one who purposed it right and particularized it the way it is is it necessary that he should have produced it at a specific time and place like in other words that he wants this that it never that there was a moment of creation right or is it not but again maybe he particularizes it, but he's constantly doing the same thing, and he's constantly always been doing the same thing, and he will always forever in the future be doing the same thing. This second opinion has, so, so in other words, even if I tell you that, yes, all of this comes about because it sounds much more probable to say that it came about because, the, because there's some purpose to it, right? So then if there's a purpose, well, maybe there's, there still wasn't a moment of creation. Maybe the world is still eternal, and God is constantly purposing the same purpose. And that second opinion is what Ramam is going to start dealing with in chapter 20. Now, okay, I'll, I'll halt here. And now let's open the floor. And I, I know at least Yosef was itching to say something. So go ahead. Yeah, so what I wanted to ask was that um, Maimonides was a philosopher, and, and that's great. But the people today who are searching the things that seem to have um, no benefit to mankind, like sending a probe to Mars instead of trying to find the cure for cancer. Wouldn't the wouldn't Rambam prefer people to deal with the things that we still don't know on this earth instead of instead of the things that we don't know in the other spheres? Um. Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, so, so first of all, I, I think, because it, it, whenever you say what would the Rambam have said, <laughs> so no, I'm, I'm just yeah. everybody, from, everybody from what always we just learned about about the searching of of these yeah. roles of and physics and stuff. Right. So I I would say first of all, and we 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 have come across this before. Everyone across the entire spectrum of at least Judaism. Right in history has always brought the Rambam as the guy who supports whatever it is that they're trying to say, <laughs> right? Because if you can say that the Rambam agreed with you, then you're already on solid ground, right? So there isn't a single movement in the history of Judaism that hasn't claimed that the Rambam was their guy, right? So it's similar here. Like so, whenever you say what the Rambam would have done, I'm I'm in danger of of injecting my own. I I, I want the Rambam to say like this because that's what I think, but. 
I mean, first of all, from the Mishnah Torah, you can see clearly, and the Ramam definitely lays out, you know, priorities, right? You know, human life and the basic Jewish priorities of human life and and um, and 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 health and so on. So clearly, Ramam would have, if if you gave him only ten dollars and he could use the ten dollars to to cure a, a sick patient versus ten dollars to discover why the sphere number seven has you know, 17,964,612 uh, stars versus 611, I'm sure he would have used the $10 to cure the guy who was in front of him. I don't think that anyone, I don't think you can doubt that based on like myriads of writings in the Rambam, which are founded in the Torah. But, but the, um, but I, I don't, but I also know that the Rambam was certainly very interested in finding out about these fears, you know, and, and doing all the mathematics and figuring all this stuff out. And if you told him, that we could send the probe up into one of these spheres and come up with some interesting answers that might shed light. It's hard to imagine him not wanting to do that, you know? So, so I mean, he, he wanted to know the answers to all these questions, you know? Um, and, and, um, and he certainly was very interested, you know? If, it, it would have been incomprehensible in his time to say that one day we can send a spaceship up there, you know, or use a telescope to peer you know, billions of light years out into the who knows where. But but it's hard to imagine him not wanting to know that stuff, you know, because and, and our, you know, so so but when it comes to priorities, you know, what you ask is obviously an important question. But, well, you know, on, but if we don't learn more about the universe that's around us, you know, who knows, you know, what we'll learn that will help us very practically in the world we're in today. You know, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I mean, but yeah, obviously, if, if, if it's, if when you're if it's that of much of a binary question right you know do i help the sick person or do i help do i find out more about mars to me that's not not a question certainly not a halakhic valid question but is is it really that of a binary you know what i mean choice yeah. like you know no knowing um i mean philosophy can seem to be um an esoteric uh uh endeavor that doesn't have as much practical meaning, you know. Uh, on the other hand, we'll see as as we continue, and I think we've seen a lot of this already. But as we continue reading the Rambam, we're going to go through. We have probably another two months at least of of this kind of debate back and forth, right? About about these kinds of issues, you know, whether the world was created uh, ex nihilo, whether there's purpose to the world, all these kinds of lofty philosophical questions. But then he's going to get into, you know, um, you know, time and mitzvahs, you know, why we do the mitzvah, why the Torah tells us to do this, why the Torah tells us to do that. And it starts getting more and more practical. And then then we start seeing how this type of an outlook on life leads to a certain type of life. You know, it leads to a certain type of meaning. I mean, just like we learned before, you know, the fact that Ramam says that everything if that if we believe that everything is the way it is because God willed it that way, as opposed to the fact, as opposed to the Aristotelian way or the scientific way of saying it is that way just because it has to be, knowing that there's purpose in our life makes a difference. You know, if there's no purpose, you know, then what do you, what do we care? You know, then what's the point? Why be good? But if there's purpose, then you start wondering, well, I wonder what that purpose is and how do we know what that purpose is? And, and, and that's the as we go through the book, those are the thoughts that he, he once he establishes a purpose and he's like, well, well, so then what is the purpose? What's the point? You know, and, and obviously that's going to lead to questions like, well, you know, God, you know, justice and righteousness, and the purpose of the, the Torah is leading us in a certain direction. You know, so the philosophical ideas do have a real practical per meaning, you know, and anyway, go ahead. I see another. Hand. I, have, I have a question and the fact yeah. that we can't. Formulate the question is reflective of the question itself, and that is, how does time uh, play into all this? I mean, I, I'm kind of a, a, a prisoner of the Big Bang theory. Okay, there's right. a linear, and there was a big explosion, and then the universe was created. Mm -hmm. But if the God or the, the creator or whatever term you want to use doesn't exist within a time framework that right. extends beyond time, which um, uh, we, we're told is part of a, a, a right. Judaic. Then how does this play into this whole uh, debate between Aristotle and, and Maimonides? If if God is beyond time, and the time itself 
is a fiction that has no basis in the real world. Yeah, so 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 it does play a lot into the debate between the two of them, because part of Aristotle's arguments was an argument based on on time, right? Um, and 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 uh, but but and but Rambam emphasized on several occasions that time itself is a creation, right? Time itself is only relevant when we're discussing. Rambam says when we're discussing motion, right? So it, it, then, 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 when you discuss motion, time makes sense. I can discuss, you know, well, how much time it took for for this ball to get from point A to point B, and how much time it took for this ball to get from point A to point B. And you can measure time in that way. Without motion, time makes no sense. And the Rambam says, and without any existence, if there's nothing in the world, then there's nothing motion. There's no movement, so there's no time. Nowadays, it's even more advanced behind that, beyond that, because we know that. I mean, you and I, it's extremely difficult for us as human beings to conceive of time as anything other than something that's that's very solid and measurable, right? Even when you tell me a thousand times, right, that um, that the theory of relativity has been proven many times over, we know that it's true, right? And that the, that as you, you know, um, that it, if something is moving faster, time is traveling slower, okay? Now, now, so, and it's been proven, right? They've taken very super accurate clocks and put it in a satellite versus on Earth. And after it runs around the world a few times, it comes down, the clock is, is a few nanoseconds behind, right? And it, this has been shown, but, but I could, I could hear that, but I, it's, it's, yeah. I still can't, it just doesn't compute in my brain, you know? You know, maybe Einstein's brain was able to see that, but my brain can't, you know? But I know it's true, though. You know, so so and and obviously, so so I'm going to make a statement, but even though I can't truly comprehend that statement, I remember but this. So so I'm going to say that before the Big Bang, right, there was no such thing as time, right. So when we say even that sentence itself is an oxymoron, before the Big Bang, the word before is is a is a is a, is a time word, right, right. So so I recognize that. I just don't have any other better way to say it. But the truth is, is because we are creations, you and I are made up of atoms and and and, and molecules and and so on and compounds that 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 are subject to those rules, right? That were created at the time of the Big Bang. We can't comprehend something that's outside of the Big Bang, which is the very definition. It's the very reason why Ramam emphasizes so many times why it's so important to recognize that God is above any corporeal uh, explanation. Like any word that we try to use to describe God is by very definition wrong from the outset. Because it's you and I trying to explain something that we simply can't pre comprehend, right? Everything about us is physical, right? We are designed, we live in a world, we're made up of things, our brains simply can't see those things so you and i will never be able to contemplate the question of what was before the big bang right and i'm using the word big bang as synonymous with creation right because but you know you can debate whether that's a good idea or not but that's what i'm doing okay so what was before the uh, there's no way that you or i can even think about such things you know and 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 it's the rambam's answer to a lot of questions like you know the famous question of uh of um uh, you know, how could it be that we have free choice, but but God, you know, but God still knows what's going to happen tomorrow. And so the Ramam simply says, you know, when you talk about God's knowledge, that, that's something that you and I don't even understand. Right. If, if I knew what was going to happen tomorrow. Right. Then it would be a challenge. Right. If I know that tomorrow there's going to be a traffic accident on this corner of Avenue A and B. Right. And and then and then tomorrow it happens, right? How could it be that the guy had a choice whether to hit the brakes or not, right? And then he didn't hit the brakes. You know, I knew it was gonna. So that and you can ask that question. But by, when we talk about God's knowledge, it's just not a relevant question. But but the, but these are yeah. So so time itself, you know, we think it's so solid because because this is the world that we live in. But it's not. You know, if we were in even in this universe, if we were flying in a rocket that was going at just beneath the speed of sound, time would go freaking slow, <laughs> you know? If we travel around the universe and come back in such a rocket, you know, our great, 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 great grandchildren would be running around the world and we'd still be 25 years old.
you know but how do we comprehend such thing i don't know you can't we can say such things but to understand them i don't know i can't anyway exactly. that's yeah right that's, right. How, that's helpful in being unhealth yeah sure. right right yeah it's just that it's, there are certain things that we simply cannot understand you know and and, and it's just really if there's one point of this book until now comprehending when ramam blasted into our brains during the first chalek right how important it is to realize that we cannot comprehend God, right? And this is the reason why, you know, because God is beyond all of the physical things that you and I are made of and know. Well, then one last question. Why couldn't he have shortened uh, his uh, treatise here and said the God to perplex? I don't know. <laughs> Move on. Well, um, good question. Maybe it could have, but as we learn more, then you'll see why, why the things that he says in future are are important um i'm trying to think if we can do chapter 20 it's pretty short let's see maybe we can maybe we can do it um so let's try it try 20. aristotle demonstrates regarding all natural things that they do not come about by chance okay we talked about it. remember that the third possibility was things are because that's just the way they are right the great dice roll happened at one point and and this is the way it landed right his demonstration being, because fortuitous things do not occur either always or in the majority of cases, right? The natural things, however, occur either always or in the majority of cases. The bottom line is what he's saying is, is that um, the, um, the things that are natural that happen in the world, they, 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 they happen either most of the time or all the time, right? And what that means is, Right. Statistically speaking, right, if if you um, uh, I don't know if you uh, just whatever, if you plant a oak seed, see, you know, an acorn, it'll grow an oak tree. Right. So um, sometimes it might not because there's probably some reason why. But usually when you plant an acorn, it'll grow an oak tree. Right. So so those are the causes that usually result in the effect of the oak tree growing. So everything that happens in the world, there's cause and effect. So we see it, right? Things don't just happen. They happen because that's how the world is set up, right? You know, if you, if you, if you strike a match, you light a fire, so on. All the things that you and I do in this world are based on the assumption that when you do certain things, certain things will result, right? So thus, the heavens and all that is in them are also, right? Um, you know, they in certain states that do not change, either in their essences, right? Or through change of place. Right. They are the way they are because that's the way they are, because that's the way they have to be. As for the natural things that are beneath the sphere of the moon, some of them occur always and others in the majority of cases. Instances of what occurs always are like fire makes things hot or a stone when you drop it, it falls. Some of the things that happen in the majority of cases are the shapes and acts of the individuals or every species. Most people, when you stick a pin in their, into their skin, they'll, they'll, they'll wince in pain. Right. Uh, so that some people might not, but most people will, right? Um, if there, so because, so we see that it's not chance. It's happening because it's not chance that the person said, ouch, he said, ouch, because you poked him with a pin, right? So, um, so, so, so if the particular things of the world are not due to chance, how can the whole of it be due to chance? So every single thing we see happens because of a cause. So then the world itself is happening because of a cause, right? Right? Because that's the way it is. Here, the text of the statement of Aristotle and his refutation of his predecessors, right? Aristotle was arguing on those who said that the world just happened to be because it happens to be, which interestingly now is becoming a more and more popular theory among scientific philosophers that, that, of, that of the multiverse theory, that, that all those constants are the way they are and all the possible chances could have happened, but we happen to be in the universe where this one happened, right? Other people have thought that the cause of these heavens and all these worlds is, is to be sought in their spontaneity. He's, this is uh, Aristotle's words. They say that the revolution and the motion that is differentiated and constituted in all things according to this order were due to their spontaneity because it just happens to be. Now, this is a point that arouses strong astonishment. I mean, the fact that they say concerning animals and plants that they do not come about and are not produced chance. Because look at the animals and the plants. They have a cause, right? Which is either nature or intellect, right? Either, either somebody decided, you know, to work the field, plant the plant, right? That's intellect or nature. You know, the acorn falls from the oak tree and it grows to be an oak tree, right? 
it wasn't a haphazard thing generated from every seed of sperm, but for this particular seed, there's an olive tree and this sperm a human being, right? At the same time, however, they say the heavens and the bodies that alone, in other words, those are the big things up there that are causing the world to work the way it works. Those just happened by chance. That doesn't make sense. If everything down here didn't happen by chance, because it's all caused by the things that we can identify, and all of those things were caused by the th things in the spheres, then why shouldn't it be that the things in the spheres are also being caused by something that has to be, right? Now, remember, nowadays, we obviously don't believe in spheres anymore, but we look into the heavens and we do have rules for why the, the it is the way it is. But I just took in 2023 a step beyond that. Anyway, so that this is the text of his statement and he starts to explain in a more lengthy passage the falsity of these imaginings. Okay, so um, unfortunately, I think that, well, all right, let's, let's, uh, no, I don't think I can go for this. It's going to be too tough. I think we should stop here and uh, continue, finish chapter 20. But just la laying down for the end of today, uh, we lay down the idea that, um, that, uh, that Aristotle disproved those who said that the world is just chance by showing that nothing in this world that we see is just chance. It all happens for a reason, right? Remember how Ramam refuted that already, right? Ramam refuted that by saying, no, so that's how Aristotle refuted the chance people. Rambam refutes Aristotle by saying, yes, everything that we see in this world has a cause, right? Right? A natural cause that we can see and identify, right? And those are the rules that govern the world that we live in, right? But those rules only apply once this world was created. Prior to the creation of the world, right? Those rules didn't exist. But, but that's a, a, a different point. So uh, we'll continue from here next time. I'm just going to open the floor for any any more questions or observations. You know, we're going to have a, a lot of this to go. We still have probably another, I don't know, another bunch of chapters. But That's you'll see, it's, it's going to lay it some strong foundations so that we'll really get to understanding what chapter three is famous. There's a lot of things in, in part three. This is one of the most famous sections, part three, is chapter after chapter on Tameha Mitzvot, explaining the Torah, the reasons for the Mitzvot of the Torah. And, um, and, and if you understand, Raman says the world has a purpose, then you can understand why it's so important for us to understand, uh, to understand how to accomplish and achieve that purpose. But um, all right, I'll stop there. If, uh, right. Well, Tia, if you're all Very good. good. All right, Thank we'll close you. the shop for the day. And uh, Amir Tzashem, next week I will be learning Amir Tzashem. But the week after, uh, I'm going to be in Poland. I'm going to be in Poland for Hanukkah, uh, not for tourist reasons, but for the army. <laughs> so, um, oh. yeah. All right. Did you see uh, Rav Vitzel's post this afternoon about the giant rat that they discovered? I, I saw the thing. I didn't read it carefully. I didn't... Yeah, so I just it's it's amazing because Rambam says that we already understand everything down here on Earth. Oh, obviously, right. <laughs> there's new animals. I, yeah, obviously we we don't understand everything. That's one thing we learned. But there's no, I mean, you know, you can't blame people back then for what they didn't know. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You know. All right. All right, have a wonderful evening, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Take care. Bye -bye. Good night. Good night. Bye.